Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our second meeting. It's really exciting to see you all here. Um, just a reminder that we are recording the meeting, so it will be available on YouTube. Um, if at any point you want to go back and watch some information, um, feel free to go to YouTube and just uh, all you have to do is type in the search ECAC um, Renewable Task Group and you'll actually see all the task groups will probably show up. And so you could watch the others as well if you're interested in what they've been doing as well. Um, so I just wanted to very quickly start with the uh, land acknowledgement, but a couple of things I want to remind everyone to please um, just start with your pronouns again. Um, so I'm Stephanie Chicarello. Again, I'm I'm she, her, and um, if for any reason at some point this meeting does get zoom bombed, remember that you can um, just close yourself out of the meeting um, or we'll shut down the meeting if we can't remove the person we'll tell you what to do so just be aware that that a zoom bombing will be inappropriate language or images um, and you can just immediately close yourself out of the meeting and leave the meeting so I want to start with the um, the uh, land acknowledgement so this is a statement of the indigenous heritage of the land we humbly acknowledge that we stand on Nonatuck land, acknowledging also our neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Gazi Haya. Thanks, Stephanie. So I'm Gazi Haya, uh, two first names. My pronouns are they, them. And I just want to remind us of our agreements that we talked about last time uh, to put people and relationships first, to stay aware of our language, to avoid jargon or technical terms, um, to really pace ourselves and give ourselves the opportunity to have a slow and thoughtful pace, um, to share more if you're typically a quiet person and think about stepping back if you're one who tends to talk a lot, um, to do our best to keep everything that's shared here uh, confidential, and to be thinking about uh, learning about personal and cultural values of everyone in, group, in the group, remembering that what's good for you might not be good um, for everyone. So I just wanna take a quick moment um, and make sure that those agreements still feel okay for everyone. And if there's anything that um, anyone has thought of that they'd like to add to our list. And no pressure if there's not something that comes up for you. Okay, and if someone has something that they'd rather share um, in an email or one-on-one -on -one conversation, you can always reach out to uh, myself or Stephanie. So, Gazik, hi. Um, this is Jim Newman. I use uh, he, him, his pronouns. Um, uh, we, at the last meeting, uh, <laughs> asked, asked if the members of the, of the committee might ask a few questions of some of their friends, your friends, uh, and uh, around some specific topics. Um, Kaya, do you want to sort of talk a little bit about sort of what we learned out of that? Yes, so not everybody had a chance to respond, but I really appreciate those who did. Um, Jen, did you want to say something? Yeah, I didn't share what I had, um, what I gleaned, and I can do that be either whenever you want me to. Sorry about that. I didn't sure. share. Yeah, I was just going to say, anybody who didn't get a chance yet, um, just feel free to email me those and we'll add it to the mix. Um, I just wanted to share briefly some of the themes that came up from the responses that I did receive. Um, certainly, uh, the major theme was the idea of that uh, the people who were responding felt that it is important for renters to have access to renewables, um, but that landlords really need to be given very concrete incentives um, to do so. There were a few ideas um, around how to motivate landlords. Um, one uh, person shared that uh, 
where they're asking, what can be done to reduce the risk um, for landlords in making an investment that will pay dividends in the long term? So like making sure that the investment is something that will turn out to be uh, positive for the landlords. And they offered some ideas that um, perhaps, and I don't understand all of these, but uh, that someone could contract for excess power back to the grid. Um, there was also a question of is collateral provided? And to me, that seems like, are we, are we, there's another person who talked about subsidizing the landlords. So offering landlords some chunk of money to be able to make these investments. Um, and pretty much everyone talked about making the incentive or the motivation be financially related. Um, and one person brought up an idea of having an incentive of some sort of designation as a green building and having a maybe a resource guide for renters um, to be able to look specifically to what property managers or complexes are considered green buildings or offer renewables. Um, and another uh, response talked about how the, the impact of the renters themselves and the community around uh, prioritizing and being excited about access to renewables would be helpful in influencing landlords. So um, did anyone want to uh, clarify anything that I said um, or add a little something? We don't have time for everyone to share, but maybe, you know, if there was anything that I said that you wanted to add to. I mean, I would just say that, you know, someone that I spoke with, um, there was just more question around, because I just want to clarify, you're speaking of solar, I mean, I think, yeah. Um, just that, like, you know, there's the question of, like, um, whether it can be done, just, you know, and whether, you know, but I was looking online and I, um, like, it is being done, like, it can be done in condos, um, you know, there are different ways to go about it. You know, it's about the like the will, and I guess this this person I spoke to said um, that you know laws and rules can can change. It's just that it would just take you know the time and energy invested by somebody who's like willing to do that, I guess. And yeah, I don't I don't know if that's um, true or not with classic management specifically, but you know it, you know it's I don't know has anyone like tried? I guess that's the thing because it's like the incentive the incentive stuff is important, obviously, but um, what about just like, there has to be some like will on their part, right? To like make, you know, like, a, like permit it. Yeah. So that's kind of like where I was in the conversation with someone. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Great. That's a great, uh, great comment. And thanks uh, both Jen, Izikaya, uh for go talking about those things and going through it. Thank everybody. Uh, who participated and uh, um, you know this whole idea of sort of okay let's take something out of this meeting go back see what it means to other people who are we sort of know about uh, I think is is really valuable for this process and you know it it's great and if we can do it that's great and if it turns out that it's tricky then that's fine um, so Andra and Dwayne, so we had a moment, uh, we had some time in between our meeting and Andra and, uh, put together a little, uh, a little homework uh, um, around the community choice aggregation and that process and what that means. I'm hoping everybody got a chance to sort of check out that video. Um, Andra and Dwayne will do a quick sort of update recap on that information, then we have an opportunity to ask questions if there are things you thought were interesting or things that were confusing. This is a chance to ask questions before we sort of dive into uh, the meat of the conversation for today, which is really kind of about that as a, as a, there are a couple of particular strategies around that. So Andra, you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, um, I think I'll just go through the slides and people can ask questions as as I go, um, that's all right. 
Um, How much did people get to see the, um, the video? Is that something that people got a chance to check out? Yep. Yeah. A few here and there. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so it's a um, pretty basic um, <clears throat> introduction to the idea of uh, community choice aggregation. Um, aggregation is buying the electricity in bulk. Choice means choosing the source according to our preferences. And community means uh, that we're in control of the money. <laughs> we decide the rate, we collect, we, we get the money and um, from, from all the customers that are in our, our group. Um, and it's going to include Northampton, Amherst, and Pelham. This is something in process that's um, being worked on. And yeah, Gazikaya asked, is there an analogy? And I, the, you know, this, this is an idea of you know, a fundraiser. You buy food in bulk, you, you choose to support a local grocery and um, everybody buys the food at the rate you choose and the funds go to, in this case, our own um, choices for electricity. So this is how the whole idea got started with residents and then um, the town officials and we've been working for two years. Um, so the, I'll just say again clearly, this, a CCA does not mean you're becoming an electric utility. We don't take over the lines. The Eversource still does <clears throat> all of that line work and um, provides the electricity to the homes. But there's the supply that we're able to, to purchase and sell. So, and just by the way, community choice energy is the same thing as community choice aggregation. So if you pay an electric bill, this is something that might look a little familiar. There's a supply charge and a delivery charge. And again, the CCA um, sets the rate for the supply and gets the money from everybody in our area. And then the utility still gets the delivery charges. Um, and there's different levels of green in um, CCAs. And the one that we are aiming for is CCA 3.0. These are made up really, it, but um, the idea is that, you know, the more you localize, uh, the, the more democratic um, it can be. And um, one of the ways it's going to be democratic is that community members will serve on an advisory committee and be um, represented by one or more members on the board, which is spelled broad. And um, then also the other idea is that you don't have to go out and buy your own renewable energy. You will get more renewable energy in your electricity because we're all collectively purchasing more. And it's been a long process, but right now we're writing a plan, an agreement for the three towns. And um, we'll, once we have the plan written, that will go to um, public review. And we hope that you'll all be part of that. So I didn't let you say anything during that whole time. <laughs> Tell me 
if you want me to go back to any slides um, or just ask questions. Uh, thanks, Andra. Um, uh, uh, in this, um, uh, so in there, there's sort of a very quick outline, similar to the outline that was in the, the video with a little bit more depth. Um, and if you got a chance to see the video, it, it's a mildly complex sort of structure that's aimed at doing some kind of cool things. Uh, and so there's a question here about uh, are any of the things that you heard in there, do they really resonate with you? When you look at them, do you say, oh man, I love that part. Uh, or are there any of those in there, you look at that and you say, whoa, that part makes me really nervous. I'm not sure how to think about that. Uh, and that'll give us then, uh, we'll sort of come back to this in a sec, uh, how we jump into a deeper conversation about a couple of particular topics around there. So anybody want any questions or comments on, on that? Uh, description. Yeah, Jen. Well, I just, I mean, I don't know that you can answer this right now, but um, just like what the, you know, the cost difference is between, you know, joining, uh, you know, this kind of cooperative versus, you know, like doing things business as usual and getting it, you know, from your supplier. Um, so one of the things about um, communities that have done CCAs and like half of practically half of the communities in Massachusetts have um, done just their own town um, uh, is that you have um, you, you, you want to keep people <laughs> so you, you keep the, the rates as comparable as possible um, and in studying it we've seen that um, you know the rates fluctuate with the utility and so sometimes the communities are above sometimes they're below a little bit more time they're they're above so Dwayne's um, um, student, uh, people who work with Dwayne did that study and the the answer is will it will be competitive it'll be um very similar most people won't notice a difference so. maybe i can add a little bit to that and Please. i try to be as, as simple as i can um and that is i i, I want to um just clarify a little bit when andres uh suggested that we would set our own rates um to some extent we do have discretion of what would how we could set could set the rates for all the members of the uh, of the aggregation uh, obviously we the aggregation the cca needs to cover its cost of paying for the electricity that we buy in bulk uh, from the electric suppliers that serve um, that, that uh, uh, provide uh, electric supply to, to to massachusetts customers so we would we'd obviously have to set a rate that at least at least covers uh, the cost of buying that electricity from uh, the uh, wholesale market through a retailer um, that would uh, we we as the community choice aggregation would negotiate a contract with a retail electric supplier supplier uh, for a specific rate to buy that energy in bulk. The idea is that buying the energy in bulk uh, provides us a um, um, a bulk purchase and and would expect to get a good rate. Um, what Andre is referring to, particularly with regard to discretionary, um, 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 how we can sort of set the rates ourselves, uh, and this would be a result of a lot of discussion and um, with with the advisory board and representation and so forth, uh, is that what municipal aggregations or community choice aggregations generally do, is is take that uh, cost of the electricity uh, that they obviously need to at least set the rate at that level, but then provide a bit of an adder, add a little bit to that to that rate that everybody pays a little bit more. And we're talking about um, per, uh, uh, portions of, of a cent, uh, a kilowatt hour. Um, and that's the money that the CCA would have discretion over. The higher we set that additional amount, the more money 
uh, the CCA would have to invest in local renewable energy generation. Uh, but obviously we can't set it too high because the rates need to stay competitive uh, with what you would otherwise be, be, uh, be, be paying uh, the, the, the utility, whether you're on basic service or your own competitive supplier. And, and, and importantly also, um, we, the CCA would not want to set it too high to, to quote unquote, quote unquote, scare people away out of the program. Um, it is an opt, opt, uh, opt out program. So uh, basically uh, all rate payers, residential rate payers particularly would be a part of the, of the aggregation, uh, but they would need to be informed uh, by regulation that they're becoming a part of this aggregation and, and an easy step, uh, an easy process for them to opt out uh, at any point uh, if they want to. Thank you. So as you can see, Jen uh, and everybody, um, the, <laughs> even just talking about the cost is a complex, complex thing. Uh, and um, so there are a couple of key th things about this. This process, as, as Andrew was saying, it's like they've been working on it for a couple of years, but it's just at the beginning. It's still really like the ideas are forming, the structures are beginning to form now is a really good time to talk about it and to, to understand how does it, what does it have to be to serve you? What does it have to be to serve you? Um, because now is the time when those ideas can really uh, be, start to make it into what this thing looks like. Um, it is kind of a big deal. It, you know, it's electricity for three towns. Uh, it's not necessarily everybody, but it's, it's a, a lot of everybody. And, uh, that's not a that's not an insignificant thing. It's this is kind of a big deal. Um, but before we jump into this, well, go, Jen, you have something else you want to say? Yeah, I just I mean I saw Gazikha's hand up though, so I don't. Did you want to oh. say? Something? Oh, okay. Sorry, miss you. That's okay. I was just going to clarify that opt out means everybody who currently gets EverSource will be switched to the. Um, community choice aggregation, unless they take a step to say, no, thank you, I don't wanna be involved. So that's something that will be really important for landlords to communicate to their renters and for the CCA to be aware of making sure how to you know, make that information available in accessible formats so that people, cause it's not necessarily going to be cheaper. Um, right. That's right. Um, and so uh, we'll come back to this in a sec. Uh, thank you for that uh, clarification. That's awesome. Um, and anytime you hear something uh, that you're like, what's that mean? Definitely put your hand up. Let's get it clarified. Because there's going to be tons of stuff in this that is maybe things you're not sure about or I'm not sure about. It's like, what's that? Uh, so. Uh, sorry, but I did oh, add another question. Go ahead. And then I'll be quiet, I'm sorry. Um, just, and I might've missed this because I, um, but within the, um, is there any like um, sort of income-based like scale for like that people, you know, would rates that people would get, you know what I mean, like different rates? Is that something that is being, you know, considered in this process, in this planning process? Do you understand uh, what I'm Yeah, um, what, uh, what we'll be able to do is um, funnel the money to projects that we choose. And so we can funnel it to um, in ways that will benefit um, people of lower income if we want to do that, if, we're, if we you know, have enough money to go around. At the beginning, it's going to be a little bit tight because um, we'll, you know, we'll just be getting started. We won't have a crude, whole, you know, and built up a lot, but um, whether we can actually change, um, set a different, like not everybody having to pay into the adder. I'm not sure. It's very legalistic, um, but there's certainly ways that we can spend the money in ways to advantage 
um, people would, would, yeah, would yeah. benefit and, from not being paying so much. Yeah. And that certainly is part of this discussion is what's going to be important. Uh, you know, what, uh, what things make it work for people, what things get in the way. Um, uh, a couple of notes. Um, one of them is, you know, uh, a couple of questions came up uh, in our conversation last time around uh, uh, fuel assistance and the other uh, built-in uh, systems of uh, fuel support. Um, and those follow you through uh, the utility. So those don't change. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I was just going to yeah. make sure we clarify is that it, there are income based programs through Eversource and there's separately fuel assistance and both of those programs. It sounds like from what um, Andrew and Dwayne understand would continue even with the CCA versus something like NextAmp where they don't go well together, this apparently wouldn't uh, negatively impact your access to fuel assistance or the income-based rates. Stephanie, you have something? So I just wanted to add to that um, there would be an extensive information campaign so people would get information about all of this um, and it would be very clearly spelled out. Um, so you know, we want to make sure that people have the information that they need. So, um, and we're required to do that. We're legally required to do that. Yeah. yeah there's a whole, the requirements around the information, when, when it actually happens, which is a ways off, uh, the requirements around how it gets communicated are huge. Yeah. Yeah, because it kind of If someone wants to sort of opt out and wait and see was it will there be like an annual time when you could reconsider and join in probably it'll be any time you want yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah. you can you, you can opt in when when you want um and you can opt out when you want yeah but you you start out opted in yeah um so i'm just gonna remind everybody of uh sort of some of the, the principles that we did, that we kind of that surfaced uh, at the last meeting uh, as a way to sort of think about, all right, what do we do? What do we think about this as a particular thing? Are there particular actions that we think are valuable to, uh, to sort of uh, pr prioritize? Um, so first, the, with the principles out of this group from last time, uh, one of them was, the first one was to really to reduce our carbon emissions in an equitable and inclusive way, to create systems that enable all members of the community to participate in climate action meaningfully. Uh, and that's, that's big and that's part of what we're talking about today. Uh, the second one is to design solutions in ways that don't advantage landowners uh, or people with means as opposed to advantaging people without means and renters. Uh, uh, that is important and that's part of what we were just discussing. Uh, the third is to emphasize working with landowners and property managers, particularly around multifamily housing. And that landowners and property managers are part of the process and part of the action as well. And the fourth is to create policies and systems that align business owner and property manager incentives with ecological and human health and wellness mm. so that we're not working at cross purposes with our incentives and our policies. <laughs> Seem pretty good. Uh, anybody have any questions about that or those? I just wanted to say a quick welcome to Cedric. Cedric oh, yeah. has joined us. Awesome. Um, welcome Cedric. Uh, and thanks for the wave. Um, so with those principles in mind, which is just exactly what we've been talking about, um, uh, so we, there, the, um, 
ourselves and the committee co-chairs, Andre and Duane, have suggested there are a couple of big, what we're calling big moves or big actions uh, related to the CCA and to renew renewable energy, mostly solar, but renewable energy in general, uh, that are what we call strong candidates for including in the plan, the overall climate action plan. One of those is developing community owned solar. Now, there's a lot of different meanings in that term. And it would be great to have a conversation about what do we mean by community owned solar? What, what would we like to see as uh, what community owned solar means? Um, and then the second is um, the, the idea of buying uh, renewable energy from outside of the town of Amherst or outside of the three town area uh, versus developing it locally. Um, and the question is sort of what do our principles and how we think about this tell us about those two uh, actions. Um, so I'd like to start with the idea of community owned solar um, and just say that, you know, one version of what's called community owned solar is that uh, the town develops solar projects, which they've already done, but develops new solar projects. Uh, and so the, the, the solar project is owned by the town, the energy is owned by the town, and it feeds our, you know, potentially uh, our process or it feeds the grid in general. That's a version of a community owned solar project. Uh, another version of a community owned solar project is one in which uh, and I think Jake was talking about this a little last time uh, in which a group of people get together with somebody who is a person who does this kind of thing, a solar developer and says, okay, we're going to develop this and we're going to own the electricity. We're going to own the use of it. We're going to own what it gets sold at. Uh, and um, that's something that is, uh, that's, it's also sort of falls under the category of community owned solar, but it's not a publicly owned uh, process. And then there's a third version of this, and there's actually way more than three, in which uh, a solar developer works with a community group or a couple of community groups to develop a solar project that then people can, uh, residents can kind of buy into as owners. Uh, and then those people who buy in, they are, can use the energy uh, and can uh, and participate in the growth and the value of that solar project over time. Um, those are three very different versions of this, although they're all kind of the same in different ways. Uh, and so I'd like to sort of think about from our first principle of sort of reducing carbon emissions in an equitable and inclusive way, which of those activities really, uh, really make sense to you? Which of them do you look at and say, well, that's nice, but it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, and are there things in there that you think, well, if we're gonna do this, we really need to do this too. Uh, those, are, those are sort of the big questions that I have for now to start this conversation. Can you explain the third one again? Sure, let's see, I'll use an example. Um, uh, uh, there is a, project in, that I know of in um, Codman Square in Boston, Dorchester in Boston. Uh, the, there are two community groups that banded together to uh, sort of initiate this development of solar power on a, I think it's on a site that's owned by MassDOT because of the tracks that go through there. I think there's a couple of MassDOT sites. Uh, what they did is they contracted, did the whole thing, got it all to happen, and then went to, uh, to community members within 
through uh, through our buddies at Cerro, actually, um, uh, community members in that neighborhood and said, do you want to buy into this? You just pay your utility rate to us. And it's kind of like CCA. You pay your utility rate to us. It's just way smaller. And uh, we'll spend that money on this paying off the loan for this thing. Uh, and over a certain amount of time, then that amount goes down and you get your, you having bought in, you get your electricity for cheaper and cheaper over time. It's not a bad model. Uh, it's also the kind of thing that C the CCA process could do. And instead of you buying, you're participating in the CCA, but instead of your rate going down over time, the CCA is making more money over time and that money can then be put back into activities that might, uh, you know, that might suit you in some way. It might be, you know, renewable or uh, uh, insulation or new equipment or something in places that you, you are living in or in, uh, other, you know, incentives that can go to, to members. Jake, do you want to talk about, or Andra and, and Dwayne, do you want to uh, sort of talk any, about any of that? Nope. Yep. Jake, yeah. And, uh, um, I don't have as many specifics about the CCA, um, but I'm, I'm very, I was really happy and encouraged to watch the video and know that this process is underway. Um, I love the idea of local ownership um, and eventually then those local projects as well. Um, ultimately, Eversource is a publicly traded um, New York Stock Exchange company that's paying uh, probably a lot of, uh, you know, high salaries and such, which is ultimately coming from the rate payer. So um, I, I really encourage to know that this is uh, where uh, the local community is heading. And I think back to, um, I should back up, my um, preferred pronouns are he, him, his, um, my, uh, your question about which of those scenarios is more equitable. I, I think it's certainly the third one. And the first one is is certainly more applicable than that second scenario that I was explaining last last session we had. Um, so I, I I think Dwayne and Andro will have more specifics about the CCA. I wanted to um, offer that input. Um, and I also had a question, the same question as Jen. So I think that that was a good question earlier about the um, different levels of adders or off takers based on perhaps consumption. And that could be if they say, for example, a business has a high consumption, perhaps they have a, a reduced rate or maybe even a higher rate because they're ultimately um, taking uh, or u using resources. So uh, that's a similar question about that as well. Thank you. Jake, just so you know, we're having a little bit of trouble with your audio. I'm not sure why. Um, it so it's a little bit muffled sometimes. So I think we got most of what you said, but just so you're aware. Thank you. Uh, Jen, you you want to say something? Yeah. It's just muffled. I didn't. Well, I have two things. I I don't think I'm not sure that I understand the difference between two and three. Um, I think I do, but if somebody could clarify that, and then. Um, Jake, because of the muffling, I missed you were talking about one being more equitable more equitable than the other, and I just kind of missed that because there's a lot of crunching and whatnot. I'm sorry about that. Can you hear me better so, now? Um, so the, the um, third one was more equitable because that is being community or, or within the town uh, funded, I suppose. It's not uh, sought after or um, it's not bought into by I, um, I'm, I'm having trouble, um, I guess, getting a definition of why it's more equitable, but um, any, anyway, uh, I, I thought from uh, your definition, Jim, that the third scenario was more equitable. I guess I would just offer um, that um, I think the, the question of equity um, is, is um, nuanced uh, both in terms of um, uh, of uh, what the definition of equity is uh, but also with regard to I think each of these models can 
express um, uh, equity or, or not, uh, depending on sort of how you define that, but more so in the nuances once we sort of get into that in terms of in each of these cases, it's really a question of um, where is the money coming from uh, to um, uh, pay for the capital cost of the solar. And that can be a combination of, of um, individuals or the town or the CCA taking ownership um, ro roles through equity investment in these projects and a role of loans or debt, debt um, financing for these projects. And then where do the benefits go uh, in terms of the, the um, not only the benefits in terms of potentially um, uh, good uh, prices on electricity uh, that would come from these projects, but also in terms of where does the um, rates of return, if you will, or the profits of the of these investments go. Um, and I think in each of these cases, uh, depending on how who the players are and how that's organized uh, with regard to who these who these owners are, uh, what 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 um, uh, uh, members of our community are are investing, or in the case of municipal ownership, to some extent, that's ownership uh, by everybody, in an ideal sense at least. Uh, so I think um, I think in each of these cases, there's um, the the uh, the, the issue of, of uh, equity and the distribution of those costs and benefits uh, really gets into uh, more details of, of, um, uh, of, of the um, specifics of, in each of these cases. Because you can. Can I just clarify? Um, so right now we're talking about different ways to have local solar panels right? And we're talking about that because we want to think about with the CCA where we buy the solar from, whether it be some solar field or I don't know what they're called, um, somewhere else, or if we want to try and have our own source of solar right here. And, ha and now, now we're talking about different versions of how to go about that. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and kind of the, the reason to do that, uh, yeah, go ahead, Don. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> You're still not unmuted. Try again. Nope. I'm watching. I can see. There you go. Hey. Sorry about that. I forgot I was muted by... Um, whoever muted me way back. Um, but in any event, it seems to me we're talking about two different things. We're talking about a, a company, if you will, a CCA that basically is a supplier distributor of, of electricity, which it's buying from someplace else. And the ownership of a generator of electricity, which is this whole idea of participating in an ownership way with solar panels to make this thing easy. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not really well versed in this and maybe you all can help me. My understanding is we're buying electricity through the grid. Um, can you buy electricity from your own generating source or does it go through the grid and come to the CCA? I mean, is there really a distinction between saying we're, we're buying our own generated electricity as opposed to we're generating electricity, putting it into a pile of other electricity and buying back green generated electricity from the grid? And maybe you can help me understand that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Dwayne, you so, want to talk about that? Yep, and and um, it gets complicated, I guess, but it will, we'll try a very simple version. Um, and and uh, absolutely, uh, you know, unless you have solar on your roof and you're using it right in your house and it never escapes your house, um, then uh, only in that case can you say, I am consuming solar electricity that's, that's coming from that solar panel. Uh, in the case where you have a solar project in a field, say it's in Amherst, it's in a field, it's co-owned by some combination of, of uh, either the town or, or Amherst residents or the CCA, um, that electricity 
physically and electronically, uh, that electricity goes into the grid and it follows the laws of physics. Uh, it goes down the wires um, the way, and don't ask me to explain this part, but it goes down the wires the way physics uh, prescribes how electricity flows and whether those electrons are often called green electrons um, get to your house uh, and the house of the owners um, is anybody's guess. And I can assure you that uh, you can't trace that, those electrons. <clears throat> uh, but uh, that being said, um, you know, Massachusetts and many other states have organized uh, sort of contractual paths uh, by which a um, owner of a project that might be um, far away or a CCA that has a contract uh, to purchase the, the, um, uh, the power that comes from that solar farm or solar array, uh, then uh, they can, con and they contractually um, agree to purchase all the electricity that comes from that array. That can be helpful to the array. Uh, and then the CCA can also um, take claim uh, to uh, providing their customers with uh, power coming from that array. Um, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not the exact electrons that were spun off by that array for sure. Um, but um, it's uh, contractually um, uh, it can be traced to those to that uh, that project. So, so I'm sorry, but so then what we're really talking about is incentivizing the production of green electricity, because you're not really buying the electricity that gets generated from a particular place. But the more we want to, whether by contract or otherwise, Dwayne, the more we want to buy green electricity, the more that gets produced to a certain extent. I, I might take that a little further, huh, Dwayne? Yeah, please. That, that, well, yes, it's not the exact electrons. We're actually contracting with those producers for that electricity. Uh, and that's what that's what happens now, right? Yeah, but uh, your national grid, Eversource contracts with specific producers, and to some extent, they just buy from the grid because they can do that. Uh, um, and the ISO manages. So there's another group outside that manages it. Right. But but w the idea of the CCA is the CCA would actually pick particular producers and pay those producers for the energy they were generating. So it's pretty direct. And okay. It, yeah. Oh, I, I, and I'm sorry to kind of dominate this. I don't no, usually no, talk no, that. No, much. And, and so, I guess, yeah, go so, ahead. Don. So what you're what you're basically saying is, yeah, we have a contract with this producer of solar elect electricity. We have that contract, and and we pay them for that. I take it. Um, However, the electricity itself goes through the grid and whether we get that electricity actually or some other electricity, because a lot of it, as you were saying, Dwayne, depends upon peak times and what plants are running and what plants aren't running. And, and I happen to do an investigation into a, um, a power plant in Agawam. So, I, I mean, I understand ISO and I understand the whole piece. And, I don't mean to confuse things, so maybe I should just shut up. That's the easiest thing. Yeah, so well, there, there's ways to help green the grid. And that's um, the, and then there's saving up money and actually putting solar on the roofs of buildings that will use the, the solar because there's lots of people during the day using electricity there. Um, and by little by little over time, ideally we do that more and more and we draw less of the electrons from the grid. So in a way that is 
creating a community resource because collectively we're, we're taking less, we're, we're having to purchase less from some other provider elsewhere. And the more we can do that, um, you know, eventually perhaps we can have little microgrids where a few buildings can share the electricity that one building that has a good roof for solar um, actually is, produces. Those, those are the kinds of creative ideas that, that <laughs> excite those of us who've been working on this for a while. Yeah, and, and you know, as, as it's become clear again, uh, this is a complicated little world and it's very regulatory driven. But what we want to try and do is get to the parts of the, this process, which it's, it's very tricky to do, get to the parts of this process that are, uh, that actually affect us as people and what do we care about in terms of the parts that affect us as people? Um, Kazi Kai, did you have something you wanted to say? No? Yeah? I have, after, oh, okay, Duane, yeah, go ahead. Kaya. Yeah. I was just going to try and clarify again to Jim's point. I'm feeling a little lost in the weeds here. Um, but is, am I understanding it correctly that, um, that I, there's sort of two driving forces? One is to um, use cleaner energy, which is better for our health and planet and all that. And then another is to try to move away from dependence on outside, like, like almost like local food. Like if we can grow our own, then we're not so dependent on someone far away to grow our food. And so we could take care of ourselves better. Is it a little bit like that in terms of energy? Like if we were able to be in charge of our energy here, then if something happened in the rest of the world, we could a little bit better take care of ourselves here. I think those are important um, attributes and values that um, clean energy and distributed energy can um, help to address. Um, um, but what I, what I think the other perspective I wanted to bring to this and to get to sort of Don's point, but I think also uh, Ghazi Kaya's point, the other way sort of to, to frame this or look at this is that um, there is um, expectation that the Commonwealth through all of its program, programs and policies will be moving to 80, 100% uh, renewable uh, electricity generation by 2050 is sort of the, the time frame they're talking about. In Amherst, we want to uh, sort of be a leader and do that quicker. Uh, so to some extent, um, uh, you know, we could just sit back and say, okay, well, the Commonwealth's going to take care of it and uh, we'll, be, we'll be green by 2050 and, and we don't really have to do anything. Um, the issue that I think this ownership issue really gets at is that um, obviously, uh, and we'll talk about solar uh, just as an example of renewables, um, a, a solar project in a field owned by a third party um, um, is wonderful with regard to re, uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and addressing climate that we all um, are, are, uh, are critical and is, is uh, we care about. But it's not really that different than a power plant economically. Uh, and in terms of the, the welfare and the, the um, economic value to the community, it's really not that different than a, than a coal-fired fire power plant in Holyoke. Um, it sells electricity at, at, at the rate it can get. Um, and all the profit rates of returns and so forth accrue to the owners uh, out of, out of uh, uh, at a community and probably at a state, even uh, owners of, of many of these uh, solar projects that are being developed now, typically uh, financed by Wall Street uh, capital. Uh, and so um, the idea of local ownership is not only to um, uh, address and, and, and contribute uh, and protect to even accelerate the contributions to uh, reducing um, uh, carbon, uh, uh, re addressing the climate issue, uh, but also uh, to recognize that this clean energy and, and distributed energy being sort of small small energy 
as opposed to centralized power plants really opens up for, for the first time really in, the, in, in our electricity sector, opportunities for what we refer to as sort of energy democracy, uh, where um, individuals and local organizations can take more control and decision-making uh, with reg and ownership uh, of their power production. Uh, because it doesn't take um, what it takes to build a centralized power plant, uh, which, you know, citizens of a community aren't going to take that on. Um, and so it, it's really, uh, I think a lot of this is really about how does um, Amherst um, and, and, and the CCA uh, in this, in, 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 for Northampton, Pelham and, and Amherst, uh, really want to look at this uh, with regard to how can we not only capitalize on the greenhouse gas mitigation that solar and renewables will provide, but also an opportunity uh, to keep the, not only keep those, uh, uh, keep that economic value local, but also in a way that would distribute that value equitably across the community. Dwayne, that was lovely. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, who would know? Dwayne's a revolutionary. Well, we, we all are. We're trying. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Zikaya. Thanks. That was great. So if I were talking to other like uh, community members who maybe identify as low income or BIPOC folks, what would be ways that like questions that I would want them to know to ask? Um, as this process is going and what would I want to tell them are ways that that we could get involved in making sure that we're a part of the conversation about where those, you know, rate levels are set that they're not too high that it's gonna um, put people in jeopardy and um, You know, what are the, what are the questions that we need to be thinking about? What are the ways that we can get involved to ask those questions? Great question. I'm going to hand it back to you guys. Andra. Um, one of the things that will probably be offered is um, opt up options. Those will be more expensive. Those will be um, ways for people to purchase more of the greenness of the, of the um, supply. And, you know, that's something that, that people will need to be very well educated about so that um, no one opts up without understanding, you know, what it's going to cost them. Um, we might have, um, you know, everybody will be at, uh, you know, 25% of their electricity coming from renewables um, based on what we contract with the supplier. So that would be the basic. And then um, pay a couple, you know, a couple cents more and per unit of electricity and you, you can get 50% um, or all the way to 100%. So I think that's something for people to be really aware of, you know, sort of consumer awareness around energy. Um, so I would think as well that there's a, a couple of things here within the structure of this company, as Don described it, uh, which is the, um, the community choice aggregation thing, uh, that are probably good questions to ask. And I, I would... Uh, and I'd be interested in whether these questions make sense to, to everybody on the, on the call. You know, one of them is probably, is there some kind of community board that I could be involved in or I could get somebody involved in? And, 
Is that something that is likely to happen? It will happen. We're writing the, you know, <laughs> legal plan right now and putting in a very strong community advisory committee. That's great. Are there any thoughts about uh, from from the group about what you know what that needs to be or or how like any questions about well how would you be involved in it or things like that? Does anybody have uh, questions about that? Yeah, I'm wondering um, any of the community leaders what would make it possible for you to be involved in something like that. Like what kind of needs would need to be met for you to be able to set aside time to go to a, I don't know, monthly, I don't know how often they would be board meeting. I think um, specified time, um, just, you know, uh, say it's two hours semi-monthly or something like that, one night a week. Um, so specified time. Great, Jen. Oops, wrong button. Um, yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> the same thing. I mean, you know, just with the uh, concerns of family responsibilities and um, work, et cetera. So, you know, probably evening hours and if, um, uh, well, I was gonna say, you know, if there's any way to provide childcare, you know, but if it's during like dinner hours, but that's, you know, more about the time, like the timing being considerate of work schedules and family. Uh, Jen, I think that's a great comment. And the comment of, of recognizing that, look, this is a community board. We're going to have to think about community members and what community members actually need in order to really be, be effective in this role. I think that that's a great, great comment. Uh, that, that's huge. John, you got something? Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I, I'm. I'm sorry. I, I just want to kind of hone in. Is is this? Is the idea of a community board, in reducing to its essence, are we talking about, you know, in comparison with, a more capitalist model of ownership of a generator of electricity? Are we really talking about, you know? how to distribute or redistribute what in a capitalist system would be the profits of this. Um, you generate electricity, you, you buy electricity, and because it's community owned and because it's kind of cooperatively owned, there isn't the, the you know, profits don't go to, as somebody said earlier, high salaries or whatever else this board would be kind of putting together a plan of, of, of what to do with this, these excess funds, or, or what, what is the board trying to do? So I uh, want to clarify, we're talking about a community advisory board as opposed to the organization that is, uh, there's a different name, right? I tell, remind me, Dwayne, what's the, there's there's three entities, right? I Community can't remember what they are. advisory committee would be the um, the one that um, people from the three towns, you know, who who are just really interested. Uh, you know, a couple of people, I you know, should have some expertise that we can all draw on, um, and and then the um, aggregation board would be representatives from the different towns. Um, and that'll be much smaller and they will be the ones who make the decision, but the um, community advisory committee would have representatives, non-voting representatives. That's how we're thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. And then there's staff. There'll be you know, staff who actually run this 
you know, pseudo business. It's, it's sort of a, a public business. And they take care of day-to-day -day stuff. Um, the uh, direct board of directors takes care of the major policy with community members at the table. And, um, you know, ideally after things have been run through discussions at the community advisory committee. So, yeah. Jen. Brain. Oh, no, go, go ahead. Yeah, Jen. A quick question. I just, um, when you were mentioning that it's sort of like a business, like what, what is the legal structure of this entity? Hmm. Yeah. Good question. It's um, called a joint powers entity. An entity is actually the legal word. Um, that's why we want to agree on a name soon, because that's awful. So um, the, the Valley Green Energy um, is, is the name that we have thought of so far. Um, it would be the name of this thing that runs the aggregation. And also other programs that even municipalities that aren't a part of the aggregation could um, join in. Um, we like to compare it to the bike share. You know, we already have that, but if we wanted, that that could be something that this organization started um, and other municipalities could join in um, just for that. Um, but Don, really to answer your question, it, it, yes, the, the municipal municipally appointed board makes the decisions about how to spend the money that comes through yeah what would be the profits if you were talking about this in a more traditional as Dwayne said earlier you know some hedge fund own power plant okay basically yep so um, Dwayne, you want to talk a little bit to, to Jen's question about the, what the structure, the legal structure is? Do, I mean, is there anything to say about that? Not, uh, I didn't have anything to say uh, particularly about that. Um, I, I think um, this is all really important. I think to some extent um, uh, there's a lot of legal work and structure and details and bylaws and principal documents and so forth that still need to be written. Uh, and and, and um, that's going to be a, a process that will require and, and look for a lot of community engagement. Um, so we're talking, I think we're talking a lot of detail that doesn't exist quite yet. Um, uh, and we're sort of more at the structure, uh, structure and building the structure and the community in, uh, uh, engagement part of it. Great. That's great. I can answer Jen's question in a certain way. Any town can do a municipal aggregation for their own residents and businesses, um, but it's just theirs. So the fact that we have three municipalities working together means we have to create a different entity. And, and, and there are um, but, you know, different legal ways to do that and towns do joint projects all the time. They share, you know, trash. They, they share um, waste management, whatever. So the one that we're doing really does set it up as kind of a public business. And maybe, maybe I can add a little bit more to that uh, now that I sort of uh, see where the conversation's flowing. There are legal constraints. <clears throat> um, municipal uh, uh, commu any any community can develop a municipal aggregation, but it needs to abide by the rules and regulations of the Commonwealth that define how to do a municipal aggregation. Um, and so, for example, uh, we would not have a, a discretion to um, arbitrarily set 
these adder values in, uh, above and beyond the, the electricity price. Those are need to be reviewed and approved and, and limits are put on to those by, by, uh, by, by the Commonwealth and in this case, the Department of Public Utilities. Um, similarly, um, there needs to be um, clear directions for citizens to opt out of the program and information uh, distributed about the program. Um, we're also constrained by legal uh, issues with regard to, and this really comes up very much in solar ownership. Uh, and for better, for worse, um, and it's not so much of a state thing, but um, uh, part of solar, uh, part of investing in solar is really take, being able to take um, uh, take um, advantage of the federal uh, tax credits that are available for solar, uh, which uh, in my mind, very unfortunately, um, are not um, accessible to non-tax paying entities. Uh, so low income um, that, that are, are below uh, tax paying uh, uh, ranges and municipalities and nonprofits um, have a really hard time owning outright uh, solar uh, because they leave a, a substantial incentive and important incentive from the from the federal government on the table. That's that's a rule that can change over time, uh, and and um, uh, so I, I we we so sort of, that's a moving always sort of a moving target. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are legal uh, legal uh, limits and boundaries and and constraints on how uh, this can move this this will be able to move forward. And I, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, that, that's it. Yep, thanks. I think that's. I think that makes sense. You know, it's. It is a. It's a sort of. We got a bunch of regulations, like everything, right? We got a bunch of regulations that we have to live in, and uh, this happens to be a pretty complicated world, and so the regulations are relatively complicated, uh, and that's why you know this was a staff that does it. That's why putting together the documents is such a wrestle, and it takes so much time. Uh, uh, because you got to navigate all of that in a reasonable way that gets to the things we actually care about, as opposed to sort of the general way things are done. Um, um, I do think that uh, one of the things that Kazikaya brought up about, um, so the first question was about sort of how do you get involved? What is it, what if you care about this? How do you get involved? How do you get involved? Which you answered beautifully. Uh, um, and the, the second, uh, was around sort of uh, understanding uh, the value that it brings uh, um, and and the value that um, that you need it to bring I think so I uh, do you have a different way of asking that you had you did a, a much better job than I did that um, I'm not sure about that the value piece but i guess i was just trying to wrap my head around like you know sometimes the main goal is to make something more affordable or sometimes the main goal is to make something more um accessible so i was thinking in this case it's not affordability there maybe is an accessibility piece because i think i'm hearing Dwayne saying for folks who might not have been able to tap into a renewable energy source, this would give them a different option if they don't have access to those uh, federal grants or whatever incentives. Um, and I could see how from my perspective as a renter, if I'm never foreseeing being able to put up my own solar panels, then if the town does this, it can give me a way to participate in renewable energy, which I would like to be able to. Um, so I was trying to identify like, what's the, why are we reaching towards this? Um, and then uh, one question I had about the getting involved piece. Um, I think I heard you, Andra, saying that there's going to be an advisory board and then there's going to be a board that makes the decisions and that the advisory board will not have a vote in the board's decisions. I'm wondering, is there any system of accountability that's going to be set up between those two? Um, you know, I think about like our town council, the accountability is that we can decide whether to vote for them or not next time. Is there going to be a system or like something in place where the community advisory board is actually gonna have some 
sort of checks and balances about this decision decision making board? Oh, that's a great this, question. This is exactly what we're talking about in meetings twice a week right now, trying to hammer out, you know, how much power can we get into the hands of community members? And um, it, it's, it's an interesting problem, but um, in some ways being at the table is maybe more important than being the one who votes because you can steer things that way and we might be able to agree that there's three or four members from the community advisory committee on the board of directors as non-voting but participants so that the issues can come up and really be worked out so yeah. it, it's because it, of the legal structure the municipalities have to be the ones who the board is accountable to um, but I'm glad to hear encouragement to go in that direction as much as we can. Stephanie. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think, you know, the success of the CCA is going to be based on the number of people that are involved. And it needs to reflect the needs and desires of the community Otherwise, why would people really want to participate? So I think there's a real incentive, not just to be dictated by the board specifically. I mean, the board is going to need people to join and be part of this and actively involved in this. And I think the whole mission of this is specifically to meet the needs of the community members. So um, there's a lot of incentive to really be responsive to the community advisory board and the community members. But, but there was no direct election of the people. It, it will be appointed appointments by whoever makes the appointments in the different municipalities. And, and we have three different government systems. And what would be the qualifying criteria for the people who are getting those appointments? I don't think we know that yet, right? So we have some, I mean, we've identified some things, but none of this is finalized. Yeah, we're talking about it right now. Did we just lose Stephanie? <laughs> she tried to mute, I bet. I think she maybe had a, a dog moment. <laughs> I'm curious, um, Cedric, Alini, or um, Jaden, or Jen, just what like thoughts you have about the concept of being at the table but being a non-voting member and uh, how that how that could work or not work. Jen, is that my hand? Or there's a Yeah. Hi. So I think even if I wouldn't be able to vote, I think it would be a great opportunity to just share thoughts and just be involved in the process because I think it's regardless of our voting power, right? I think it's important for us to be aware of what's happening in our community um, and, and to voice it. Sorry, I have my little one play with the balloon in the back. Um, but to voice our concerns, our ideas, and recognize that others are listening to what we have to say and then taking our input and implementing into their decision. So I think regardless, it will be a great opportunity. Thanks, Alini. Yeah, Jaden. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with what she just said, just like being a part of it and being here, just like even not having the voting is definitely like enough for that. Thanks, Jane. 
Aspen. Um, yeah, Jen. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, if that is, if like the structure dictates that it has to be like that, but I think it's interesting. I think the question of like, what is the qualifying criteria for people that get appointments, um, you know, is like interesting to me and like, why couldn't community members vote? Like I, I understand that there probably need to be a certain level of expertise um, and maybe, you know, but it's not to say that community members wouldn't and or couldn't have that expertise. So, you know, that's where I'm thinking. Well, one of my hopes is that um, people who with an interest would start out with, you know, joining the community advisory committee and learn and, and become an expert. You know, I didn't start out as an expert at all. I was just a resident who thought this was a cool idea and spent the last three years kind of over my head in trying to understand it all. Um, and so, you know, partly because of that, um, the town manager appointed me to the ECAC and the manager would be the one to appoint the directors as well. So there's absolutely no reason that um, you know, someone without professional expertise couldn't be on the actual board of directors. And I, I hope that you know, there's sort of stepping stones and that we do a really good job of educating people and bringing more and more people on who represent a lot of different parts of our town than usually get represented. Um, go ahead, Jen. No, I was just gonna say, you know, thank you. I, I like I like that vision and I think um, that feels um, to me like more equitable than just saying um, certain people can vote and certain people can it just more ex Yeah, I, I think yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Jen, that, that a pathway. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Sorry, um, she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I just wanted to also sort of close the loop on something that Gazit Chaya said earlier around um, sort of the accountability. Um, and if the CCA is ultimately accountable to the towns and the towns are ultimately still accountable to their residents and citizens, that's, that's also um, something to keep in mind um, in terms of the influence that the community can have over um, how, the, how the CCA is held accountable. Can you expand on that just a touch? In, in what way? Sure. I mean. Well, I think um, in, in the way that the CCA is upholding the values of the residents that it's intended to serve, um, if residents, well, we have the community advisory committee and that's intended to give residents a voice. And if that, if that structure ends up feeling still limiting, um, then there, then there's an opportunity there to turn to town governance and to say, as residents, we want the way that the CCA is held accountable to be changed because we're not seeing our values reflected in, in the decisions that the CCA is making. Um, Ideally, the community advisory committee will serve that role, and that's that's not, you know, going, going to be necessary. Um, but always something to keep in mind: the relationship there between the towns and the CCA and the residents. Yeah, I can tell you something that we um, have been talking a lot about on the in the little subcommittee that's working on the agreement among the in the governance questions um, and that's 
you know, it's core part of the idea is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from our communities. And if we, you know, we imagine other communities are going to want to join us. Um, and how do we keep that commitment to both to equity and to the greenhouse gas reductions um, so that it, you know, it, in most places, it's not a green option. It's, you know, it's, that's not what they're trying to do at all. So we're using it as a tool um, to be able to kind of pay for itself and raise money to be able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So we don't want that to change in the future. Um, and so the citizens, the, the residents are going to be really key to helping make sure that continues. Um, mm. Our values are reflected in it. I just wanted to share real quick, um, Stephanie uh, somehow got bumped out and is trying to get back in, but um, is unable to. So, um, I am Lauren De La Parra, you are host. Yeah, I don't see her so on go the attendee to the list. attendees list, go to attendees. There's panelists and attendees. Yeah, she's not uh, in there as an attendee. She's not in there, yeah. Oh, okay. Because Ikaya is also a co-host. Yeah, she said that. Um, yeah, but the co host not, can't do it. Okay. Yeah, she said that it should not affect the recording and that we should be okay for the remainder of the meeting. So, her mm -hmm. apologies. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Shout out to Darcy, who's an attendee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Darcy. Oh, good. Awesome. I haven't been looking at the list, so I'm uh, fantastic. Um, uh, Dwayne, you had something you were going to say? I'm sorry. I... I'm actually, uh, Andrew just beat me to it. I was just going to um, also uh, indicate and disclose basically that, you know, one thing that the, um, <coughs> the this agreement amongst Amherst, Northampton and Pelham uh, is working on, on drafting is really, really important, uh, really to articulate um, not just the mechanics of the uh, CCA, but also the, the vision and the priorities um, and the principles associated with the CCA. And as Andra mentioned, uh, really, um, um, you know, two primary things in addition to, you know, maintaining uh, reasonable rates for everybody <clears throat> um, is um, greenhouse gas reductions and equity. And those are important as Andre, and I was gonna say, but Andre beat me to it, is really important because um, it is important for people to recognize that um, there is a vision for this uh, CCA to expand over time uh, to neighboring communities. And we've had, or at least other communities, and we've had discussions about what what would what would what what would be acceptable uh what what in terms of other communities joining us uh, what would be acceptable for them to join us without diluting uh the vision and the priorities um and the principles that we have so that document's going to be really important um in my mind um and um uh, i don't know exactly the process of which that agreement's going to be hashed out and drafted and whether that agreement itself might be open for public um, input. We can certainly yeah. run some ideas by this group. We're really trying to get it completed in the next month. That, that mm -hmm. would be, I think, our goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Don, you were trying to say things a few times and did not. Nope, you're good. Nope, I'm good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so this is, uh, this is, this is a great conversation. Um, the, um, the sort of really understanding, you know, the questions of like, exactly what this is and what that is are, are we're not really that the group is not really there yet uh, what they really are at is what's important 
what matters in this process that we put together? And I think we've started to answer some of those questions from this group as to participation matters, uh, potentially pathways to being in the decision-making matters. Uh, maybe uh, Andra has suggested that uh, um, how, uh, sort of what criteria might towns need to, uh, or you know, what values might towns need to sign up to in order to join the participation if it starts to get wildly successful? Uh, those are, I think, are great questions. Um, uh, does anybody have any other sort of thoughts about what those sort of kinds of things that are founding issues might be? Ah, Stephanie's back. Hey, Stephanie. Hi, sorry about that. Our, um, our network just dropped. My husband and I were both on meetings and it just completely dropped us. There's a lot of storms going on around us, so I apologize. And because I was the host, it really wouldn't let me in. It wanted me to end the whole meeting. So the trials yeah. of Zoom. So I'm sorry, I missed probably a whole lot of great conversations. So apologies. Uh, I'm glad you're back. It was all recorded. Yes, we've got exactly. it. Exactly. Good. I'll watch it later. Uh, so I, I'll, uh, I'll sort of ask that question again, which is we've identified a number of really great uh, values and, and ways in which we'd like to see those values uh, um, upheld. Are there other things that might be important as well within uh, sort of for us, other values that might be valuable or might be useful uh, or things that like, uh, does this really cover this um, that uh, that people would like to uh, like to bring forward at this point? This is a really great uh, a great conversation. Yeah, Andra. Uh, Andra and Lauren both are available. What, Andra, you are uh, muted. I have a specific question. In, if you imagine yourselves, you know, knowing just you know this much about CCA, um, but trying to explain it to somebody else, um, is there like one of the pictures and the slides that was particularly useful you know if we are going to start spreading the word about it we want to be able to provide some you know visual and i wondered if we have created anything so far that you saw that was particularly important to your understanding of it I think that's a great question. Would you mind just doing a quick like click through and we could refresh our memories and um, then maybe we could say like, oh, that one. Starting at the tail end. Andre, you are muted again in case you, uh, I know too many buttons. All right, so that's about it. Community leaders, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I, I think that um, the hands holding up the, um, the solar panels is a strong image and um, and the one and I mean you're you're talking about and um, and, and this one I think it is um,
Sure. Anyone else? Jake. Yeah. I uh, was the slide after this one, after the utility bill. Yes, this slide that sort of um, cemented things for me um, off of what the vision is, the long-term vision of the uh, community or committee effort. Hmm. That's great. And I think Dwayne was, was so articulate about energy democracy and kind of what that meant uh, about both community participation in the process and you know in the sort of at least advising the uh, decision making process as well as uh you know the the money staying within the money flow staying within the community and uh and uh and supporting activities that uh the community gets to decide what should be supported um I think those are those are pretty compelling, and that energy democracy slide I found to be pretty, uh, pretty great. Lauren found that graphic. <laughs> Did she? Oh, ah, no wonder I liked it. <laughs> I just want to throw out there that. Um, it, I've now been in like, I don't know, maybe five meetings with Andra and Dwayne and Stephanie and Jim and Lauren trying to wrap my head around this and making that video and trying to understand that video. And I still feel like I'm having a really hard time understanding this. And I've heard both Andra and Stephanie say that that's common, that this is a very um, dense and complicated topic. So I just wanted to throw out there that like, the expectation is not that we totally understand this walking away from today's meeting. The expectation is that we would just get a little taste of it. And from my understanding, the, the idea of why we want to get a little taste of it is because the town is going to be working on over the next chunk of time, getting the community connected with this idea and supportive of it. Um, because they feel that it's a good thing for our community. So this is a start just so that we have something to ring a bell, you know, when we start getting some of this education and information that's going to be sent out and that um, that we definitely, you know, everyone in this room can continue discussing and talking about and asking questions about this outside of this meeting in whatever way feels right to you. And um, and there's a piece too that like the more questions we ask, even if we feel a little stupid when we're asking them, the more questions we ask, the better um, Andra and Stephanie and Dwayne are gonna know what needs to be communicated to the community. So like part of our job is to like make ourselves uncomfortable and ask the questions so that they understand what gaps need to be filled and how best to communicate um, with the community so that people can really make their own decision about if they want to be a part of it or not that's based on them really feeling sure about their decision and not just feeling like scared by the enormity of trying to understand something new. And I would say that this is not a topic for anyone to feel stupid about asking more questions because it's not <laughs> It's not obvious to anybody, nobody. Like, I mean, even the people who work in the industry, it takes a while. There's a lot of layers to it. It, you know, it sort of starts out with kind of a simple concept, but the more we're trying to do, the more complicated it seems to get. So, um, d you know, please don't, uh, don't feel stupid asking questions. Um, and please do ask questions and there will have to be a lot of information um, and outreach to the community, but you all are sort of um, at the forefront of knowing that this is something the town wants to do. And so for you, when we start getting the information out, you'll have already had some introduction. So it will be just that much more familiar to you than it will be to most other people. So you'll actually be ahead of the curve. And we can be ambassadors, you know, sharing with folks as it comes up what we've already learned. Absolutely. Or oh, we hope you will be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Andrew, you were saying that you're hoping to have 
sort of all this sort of fleshed out a little more in the next month. Like, what's the timeline, you know, approximately? Um, like, when is this going to be sort of, uh, you know? This is a really um, unusual case. The state agency that has to review it and okay it has never seen anything quite like it. <laughs> the the things that we want to do have been um, done in pieces by different ones, but not all together. So it's probably going to take them a year to decide. And I just want to add to that, Jen, that we were in a meeting today with um, a legal firm that helps communities get this through the entity that approves it. And one example that they used of a community just doing it on their own with something very simple recently took a year and a half. So it really, we can't really predict how long it will take, even if we have everything all together. If there are questions, um, it has to go before the Department of Public Utilities. And if they have a lot of questions, that could take a while, especially because this is more complicated and unique. Um, it, it may take longer. I mean, it could be a year and a half. It could be two years. We hope it won't be, but, you know, but it, you know, well, we hope it won't be, but it could be. We just have to be realistic that we will try to do as much as we can to make everything as clear to them as possible, but we can't predict. That's a great question though, Jen. Uh, and I'm sure it's a question that is on everybody's mind who is involved in the committee right now. Yeah. It's like, how long is this gonna take? How many more committee meetings do I have to go to? Uh, we do hope to get it to the state Department of Public Utilities by the end of the year. That should be doable, right, Stephanie? sooner if we can. Yes, I don't, um, I, I would think that we'll certainly have something probably by then. That's, that's the hope is to submit something by then. But again, um, because this is a little more complicated and apparently some of the um, requirements from the DPU are changing um, a, a lot. Um, that's at least what the legal firm has told us. So you know, we're trying to keep up with the changes and then trying to get our information. So we, we hope to um, get it submitted by the end of the year. But again, it's the process that, you know, for their approval that we, we can't predict. That's the piece that we can't predict. But, you know, good to, what will be important is that we have to get this before the community or the communities, I should say, because there's three communities involved. And so the more we have community support for it, the better, you know, and that response is articulated to the DPU, that's important to know that this is something the communities really want. Right, and in the form that we're talking, that you're talking about, in the form that you've constructed, yeah. Right. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> it's like everything, right? It's like, oh, this is a simple question. How long is this gonna take? It's like, oh, I'm sorry. That's a very complicated answer. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so uh, we're, we've got about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, what I think, um, so we, uh, you know, we uh, asked you to go ask a bunch of questions uh, after the end of the last meeting uh, that was, that provided a bunch of information and it was pretty, pretty valuable. And if there are things that you haven't said about those conversations, definitely send them as an email to Gazikaya uh, so that we can start to compile those and, and respond to them within this group. Um, but we're sort of thinking, it's like, okay, what do we do this time? And, and it seems in a way kind of obvious uh, what kind of thing we might do this time uh, as something that we can go out and ask uh, our friends and, and uh, uh, acquaintances uh, about, and that would be, uh, and I must admit this was Andrew's idea, uh, that, um, that <laughs> I'm going to say this three different ways, uh, that go ahead, 
go out and try to explain this to some of your friends or some people who haven't been in this conversation and record what questions they ask. Uh, because those questions are really going to start to help, going to start to identify both what needs to be communicated better, but also what things are important. And so those are both important parts of the, the answers we get back out of this. So go to your friends, go to the folks you see on a regular basis, say, hey, I just was in a meeting. We just were talking about this com community choice aggregation thing, a uh, couple towns, what they're trying to do. Uh, feel free to bone up and use the, uh, the video to, uh, to uh, try and refresh your memory. Um, and then when you finish explaining, you say, so does this make any sense to you? What would you want to know? Record those questions and let's send them back to Gazikaya so that we can collect all that stuff up and have a conversation about this at our next meeting. Um, any questions about that? Any thoughts? I just wanted to say, not only can you rewatch the video, you could actually share it with someone. And Absolutely. Then and you know you could text them the video link and then you could say hey do you do you have any questions shoot me back the questions you know you could have a conversations but you could also use the video it's publicly available yeah that's a great point and really you could even just imagine telling somebody and write down your own questions like cuz just trying to articulate it might bring up the most important questions <laughs> and, and really um, those questions you know i'm thinking i need to you know write a draft of the frequently asked questions that that should be like something we do really soon so that's a great idea and you can also just ask your own questions that you have right now because totally. in the next day or two, you're probably going to think, oh, wait, what about this? And oh, wait, what about this? And you can share those questions too. And you can ask them meanwhile too. Just email <laughs> one of us. We'll try to uh, make it short. <laughs> Jen, what were you going to say? Yeah, it's not exactly a question about this, but I am thinking sort of about the marketing of it and like, you know, how the information, you know, um, will be. Um, you know, uh, shared and just because from talking to neighbors, I think there's so little understanding of how, I mean, like we're, you know, finding it, it's a steep learning curve for everyone, but I just, um, especially, yeah, I don't, I think that people um, just throw out, like they pay their electricity bill and like throw out the rest and like a lot of times. And so even like talking to people about the option to, have a, a renewable supplier, for instance, like a lot of people don't even know that that's available. I mean, with, whether or not they would opt in, you know, is irrelevant because, you know, it could be too expensive. But the point being that, um, yeah, I think that this is just, there's like a steep learning curve and um, how, how this gets marketed is, uh, is uh, I'm sure you're thinking about it, but it's just on my mind. And the other thing is that there are people, including my own self and family that you know we've had um uh, like solicitors come around um in earlier years when we lived here and like we got really um like we got into something that we didn't realize that we were getting into where like rates increased and you know and then we had to get out and i mean it, it's like it was just really um much uglier than we realized um and so that also um, complicates things. People are just are conf probably confused and, and leery. So. I think that's one of the reasons why that, you know, we want to make people understand that this is something the towns are behind. And this is, you know, this represents the community. This is about, you know, the communities themselves and the members of the communities. And there are requirements in terms of getting those information out. One of the things we were told today is now we're, um, communities are being required to provide information in multiple languages. So that's a requirement now. It didn't used to be. It is now, which is great. I think we would have done that anyway, you know, um, but, you know, there's going to be really strict 
ways we have to get the information to people um, to make sure that people are very clear what it is um, that we're offering them. And that's probably going to be more so than those people that just come to your door. Um, you know, so I think it's sort of the way I'm thinking of it is like the Solarize campaign that the town did. Um, that was something specifically that Amherst got behind. It was a town project and it was different than just having someone knock on your door. There were companies that were trying to sort of piggyback on what we did and that's something we'd have to be careful of is to make sure that people are clear what is a town offering versus some other company and we'd have to be clear about that. Can I just add to that as well because uh, I think it's really important differentiation uh, between um, people that knock on your door or, 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 or send you uh, uh, unsolicited um, stuff in the mail or give you a call, quite frankly, even on your cell phone, it seems like, um, uh, offering you these, uh, you know, competitive retail electric suppliers and a, and a municipal aggregation. And I, I do know that even at the, uh, at the level of the Attorney General, um, Martha Coakley, she's been really concerned about um, uh, less than scrupulous um, marketing uh, by re uh, competitive retail suppliers um, with, to directly to to homeowners because it, it creates a really um, unbalanced um, um, power position where they have all the information and you're a consumer that doesn't know too much information. And so she's been really outspoken with regard to trying to rein in the behavior of the retail electric suppliers in soliciting um, customers di directly from the uh, di directly uh, residential customers directly. She's very also on the record of very much um, supporting municipal aggregation uh, because in some way they're they're very similar. Um, municipal aggregations also work with as opposed to getting your electricity um, supply from the utility company, you're getting your electricity supply through these retail electric suppliers that compete with each other. But the big difference uh, is really that um, you have, you're in a much better negotiating position uh, and you have a quote unquote sort of sophisticated, well-informed, knowledgeable party uh, negotiating and 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 uh, um, uh, uh, entering into these agreements with the with these retail suppliers, then um, the, in the form of the CCA, uh, then um, uh, then individual residential customers. So clearly, it sounds also though like that is that is a key uh, item to to I mean, which you are are aware of um, a key item to be aware of when communicating with with community members and sort of understanding that, yeah, like Jen said, you know, I've been through a kind of a skeevy situation and, and uh, why is this different? And so that's a key communication point. I think that's great. Don, yeah? Yeah, my mute. Oh, no, my you're mute. good, yeah. God, geez. That's what happens when you're as old as I am. You can't quite figure these things out. Um, for me, if you all had come to me and I wasn't in this group, what, what I would really, what I think is the biggest thing here, I mean, obviously the, the green energy is the biggest thing, but from my perspective, if I was gonna sell people on this, it's what vision does this group, not, not this group, but does Andrea's group and Dwayne's group have in terms of using the revenue? What good things are, are going to come from keeping this revenue within the community and using it within the community. What, what's the vision for that? Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. you can share that in the next meeting <laughs> or we could talk about it in the next meeting. I just want to be aware of our time, but that's, yeah, we're, I, we're you know, I'd love to No, but that's that. as, a, as a question, that's a great question to ask. And, uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's part of what we've been getting to, but we're starting to develop some answers, right? That you guys are developing answers and hopefully this conversation has helped to uh, bring answer, you know, some more clarity and, and, and depth to those answers as well, which is ideal. Um, uh, so, Gazika, is there anything we're missing here? No, okay. I was just uh, I was right. saying I'd really love for Don's question to be something that we really do talk about at our next meeting. I think that's a great that's idea. Really yeah. important question. Yeah, that's a great thought. 
Um, uh, so it's uh, time for us to call this quits. I'd like to just thank everybody for your participation. Um, I realized that some of these things, Cedric, we haven't heard from you much. Anything you want to jump in on? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm really just listening. Um, and uh, I do, you know, just think about what, how I can uh, be part of this more. And, and, uh, and that's, as well, it's just, you know, learn as best as I can so I can teach this to kids, you know. So if we can, we can learn this. And if it's, you know, the way I can just learn this just to, to get, be able to, like, teach this to a uh, grader, then I think we, we're golden. Well, right now, this is a biology class or something. So it's awesome, though. I like it. I'm just learning. Fantastic. Thanks, Zedric. What a great, what a great way to, to close out this meeting, man. You nailed it. Uh, so um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we do take a chance to uh, to try and talk to some folks about uh, this community choice aggregation idea and to think up some questions. And we will send it, we'll probably meet again in another three, four weeks, four weeks, something like that. Uh, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much. Any final thoughts? Stay well, everyone. Thanks, everyone, so much. So nice to see you all. Yeah, really. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Peace, everybody.